Thank you for your word this morning. Father, as we get into the word of God today, may your anointing just flow into our hearts. Touch us, challenge us, convict us, lead us, guide us, deliver us, heal us. You do all these things because you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you growing spiritually? How's your spiritual life going? Is it growing? Or you become stagnant? We should always be growing, getting stronger and stronger in our faith. In fact, if you're not working your faith, you're not growing. You know, faith is kind of like muscles. If you don't work it out, it's not going to grow. All of us have a measure of faith, but depending on what you do with that faith, it's going to either grow or it's not going to grow. You don't get more muscles, you just get stronger muscles. You don't get more faith, your faith just gets stronger. You all understand that? See, a baby has the same number of muscles as I would have. But as he works them out, as he grows older, as he matures, of course he'll be able to do more because he's getting stronger. And the Bible tells us to each one of us, God has dealt us a measure of faith. So don't act like you don't have the same amount of faith as I have. You just got to use your faith if you want it to grow. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1. 1 Corinthians 3 1. Spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. And what's going on in this world, Christians that are watching on television, watching through the internet, if you want to get caught up in the argument and the division and the envy and the strife and all those kind of things, you will not grow as a Christian. Come on, y'all try to participate with me. I want to try to teach you something this morning. Listen to what this says. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, that means natural, fleshly people, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were unable to receive it, and even now you are still unable, for you are still carnal, that means natural, fleshly, you're still living just a natural life. For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Like, do you get what he's saying here? Envy? What do you think is going on in our world today? Everybody's envious of somebody else. I want, I want, you've got, I want what you've got. And it's always, all, and then what? Envy? And what comes after that? Strife. You know what strife is? Just arguing about everything. Everybody's arguing about everything. And, and, and guess what? They're both saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but they're envious, they got strife, and it causes division. You're a carnal Christian, a fleshly Christian, a baby Christian, and all you are doing is sucking a bottle if that's what you're doing. Amen. And I don't care how bold you sound and how arrogant you sound, when you make your stand out of your envy and your strife and your division, you are a baby Christian. Because you can look all big, tough, and everything in the natural on the outside, but on the inside, spiritually, you have no strength whatsoever if you cannot restrain yourself and be praying more than talking. I'm talking to the world out there too. And y'all see it all around us all the time. I mean, these people stand up with all this boldness that has nothing to do with the truth of the Word of God. And they make their stand, they make their arguments in their opinions, which are heresies if it doesn't agree with the Word of God. You'll realize that. A strong opinion is a heresy if it's not in line with the Word of God. So this scripture makes it so clear that people are going to jump on the bandwagon with one thing or another thing or another thing. You know what you need to be on? The Word of God. And if you're not reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, believing it and applying it to your life, you are on milk. You're sucking a baby bottle. Christian. Hallelujah. I hope that sinks into, that's for somebody somewhere that's listening to me right now. I just don't even want to argue with you no more if you want to argue with me about stuff like that. Amen. Amen. 
And that's all they're doing in the world today. The political arena right now with this presidential uh, uh, election coming up and everything going on, it's all about arguing about this and about that. But how about the kingdom of God? How about preaching the word of God? How about going to somebody and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them? And if they don't want the gospel, then that's going to be their problem. Because if the peace of God doesn't rest upon them, the peace of God will return to you, wipe the dirt from your feet, and they will be judged for their rejection of the gospel. But your voice, your life should be a written epistle for everybody to read it. And I'm not talking about religiously pushing stuff down. Listen, don't go try to shove, don't don't cast your pearl before the swine is the way Jesus said it. But there's so many people need to hear about the gospel. When I was at the bottom of my life, finally somebody came and shared the gospel and I had ears to hear and heart to receive. So let's compare your life with the word of God. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I could care less the color of your skin. I could care less if you're rich or poor. I could care less if you're Democrat or Republican. I care if you want to walk in the kingdom of God and in the word of God. That's what I care about. Amen? Amen? And I want you to be due diligent to do what you know you need to do to be a good citizen. But you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven before you're a citizen of the United States of America. Amen. And as I go through these points today, I hope it really challenges you to see where your priorities are today. I got 28 points I want to give to you today. Now I'm lying. I said, are we going to get finished before the sun goes down? So whenever I stop at 20, you're going to be glad it was only 20. Number one, I want you to do a checklist on yourself today. If I'm going to grow spiritually, I'm going to compare myself with the Word of God, this is number one. I am increasingly aware of the sin in my members and my weakness without Christ. If you're going to mature, you've got to become increasingly aware that there is sin still in your members. In fact, the Bible says if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. We've got to realize that, that the Bible teaches us that their sin, iniquity is still in us even after we get saved. Romans uh, 3.23, you don't have to turn it, I'm going to be going kind of fast. If I want you to turn to one, I'll, I'll tell you. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many of you have sinned? All. all of us. Romans chapter 7, let's go, Romans 7.17. Romans 7, 17. This is an amazing portion of scripture. The apostle Paul just finished writing Romans 1 all the way through Romans 6. And he gets to chapter 7. And he starts talking about he's dealing with sin and his members. 7, 17. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. This is a saved apostle Paul saying... When I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, it's because that sin in me is still drawing me. So i got to have this revelation as I get older that there is still sin I've got to reign over and rule over because if I don't, it's going to rule over me. Verse 18 says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, that carnal part of me, that's what we're talking about, nothing good dwells. That, that, that's, you know what nothing means? Nothing good dwells in your natural fleshly person. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. Uh, how many of y'all want to do good? Come on, y'all should, everybody should want to do good. But I mean, you know that sometimes you just can't figure out how to do good. I want to forgive that old rotten scoundrel, but I, sometimes I just can't. I need the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ is how he ends this passage. That there is therefore now no condemnation, which I preached on last week. That's what this is leading into. Don't feel condemned because you're still dealing with the sin in your members, but deal with the sin that's inside of you, that's, that's pulling you away. Look at verse 19. For the good that I will to do, I do not. And the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Man, that sounds like a conflicted person. But, and this is the great apostle Paul. I want to do good, but I can't really, it seems like I don't. And when I, I don't want to do evil, but it seems next thing you know, I, I done did something evil. Now, if I do what I will not to do, 
It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Amen. That seems like a cop out, huh? So when I mess up, it's not me, it's that sin in me. But when I do good, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit in me. Amen. If you don't take credit for the bad, don't take credit for the good. Give it all to God. Amen? Amen. And he lets us know because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we have victory over these things. So if you're going to grow as a Christian, you need to realize that there is still sin in your members. And without Christ, you are weak. You cannot overcome it. You need Christ. Amen? Number two, I respond quickly to sin when I'm convicted. I respond, I respond to sin quickly by bringing about true repentance. Thank God for repentance. Amen? Amen. I'm so glad that God gives us the gift of repentance. And it says in, in Romans chapter 2, it says it's the goodness of God that leads me to repentance. When I'm repenting, it's not that God's not mad. God's excited when you repent. But he says with an unrepented heart, the wrath of God is reserved for you. So if you're growing spiritually, when you do something wrong, it's going to bother you. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. It's going to convict you. It's going to make you feel bad and it's good <coughs> to feel bad. <coughs> Excuse me. It's good to feel bad about doing bad. So I respond to sin quickly and bring about true repentance. The Bible tells us, and I read on this last week, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, that if we walk in the darkness, there's no light in us, for God is light. And then he says, but if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whenever you mess up, the quicker you repent, the better off you're going to be. And what is repentance? Changing your mind, changing your behavior, your actions. Amen? Changing your direction. If you're in the flesh, repentance means get back in the spirit. And you can do that without even saying anything. You could be fixing to get in the flesh when somebody's talking to you. You can choose yes, to get right back in the spirit. To watch what you say. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 says this. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. For godly sorrow, see, when you're sorry because God's convicting you, you sorry towards God because you know that you, you, you did something that was wrong towards God and it leads you to repentance, to salvation, to deliverance. See, some people repent because they got caught. And that's worldly sorrow which leads to death, and that same scripture will tell you that. The way the world is, whenever you get caught, you're not really sorry for the sin, you're sorry you got caught. Amen? Amen? And you say, I'm sorry. Why? I got caught. That leads to death. But whenever you do something wrong, okay? Let's say you went out Friday night and you got drunk, and you woke up Saturday morning, and you feel bad. Not because you have a hangover, but because you sinned against God. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> and that, that godly sorrow, because of what you've done in your relationship with God, leads you to a repentance that brings life. And if you're going to grow as a Christian, you need to repent quickly. It says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When you learn to repent quickly, when you learn how to get out of the flesh and back into the spirit, you're going to feel the refreshing of God's presence because forgiveness comes. And it's good to be forgiven. And we talked about that last week about having no condemnation. You don't have to be ashamed or feel guilt anymore because you are forgiven because you've repented. Number three. Somebody say number three. three. We've only got 17 left. Trials and spiritual battles come. You realize that as a mature Christian. But I maintain my joy. I maintain my joy. Listen to what the Bible actually tells us in James 1-2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. When you fall into, it says, my brethren, count it all joy when you have trouble. 
Why does God tell us to do that? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. You got to learn to have joy no matter what's going on around you. See, joy is a little bit different than happiness. You got to maintain the joy of the Lord. Nobody can steal your joy away. Amen. Amen? I hate to say this, but I got to say it. <laughs> There's some people that are just joy suckers. They want to suck the joy out of your life, your happiness. Joy doesn't like it when I say that. Love you. Y'all know what I mean? They, they, just, they just can't stand to see you happy. Envy, strife, division. Why can you be happy if I'm not happy? Why can you have a job that pays that much and I can't have a job that pays that much? We're going to see the Bible will teach us that to him who has, God gives more. To him who does not have, God will even take what he has away. Amen. That's God's way of doing things. But we got a whole worldly mindset that acts like it's not supposed to be that way. Because one learns to sow and reap and the other one doesn't. One knows how to bring increase and the other one doesn't bring increase because he lives a life of fear. I'm jumping ahead of myself. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19 says this. Rejoice always. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Always be rejoicing. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Rejoice always and in everything give thanks. Do you know that whenever you're giving thanks that you're going to be happy? Yes. If, you have no, if you're not grateful, you're not going to have joy. Gratefulness and thanksgiving brings joy with it. Rejoicing means to give you more joy. It's like refilling, I'm rejoicing, I'm building up my joy. Because joy brings you strength. Amen? Don't you like to be around somebody that's got some joy rather than just boudet all the time? Amen. How many of you know what a booty is? A bob in? You know, a bob in? That's a, a pouting? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Number four, I see trials and temptations as an opportunity to grow and to mature. So when something goes wrong, I don't go crazy. Isn't that an easy way to say it? I see that. This is an opportunity to grow. Blessed is he who endures the temptation, who grows when he's going through trials and tribulation. I don't like trials. I don't like tribulation. I don't like trouble. But when trouble comes, and let me tell you, if you never had trouble, it's coming. Trouble will come. Amen. How are you going to handle that? You need to grow in the midst of it, mature in the midst of it. Whenever I go through bad times in my life, I feel like everything's coming down on me. Like, where are you, God? Why are you letting this happen, God? What's going on? Why? And, and you all, but then as the time goes by, you begin to mature in it. You say, you know what? I see God's hand in the midst of this, what he's doing in my life. And I begin to grow. In other words, heaven is going to be filled with overcomers. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? Over and over. To, he, to him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. Overcoming means you've got to overcome the troubles and tribulations and trials and temptations in your life. And you grow through them. Number five. Amen. Y'all ready? I see all things in the light of God's word. Whatever's going on in your life, you've got to bounce it off of the mirror of God's word. Because you know what it says? It says in 2 Corinthians, you can turn to there. Go 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, very familiar scripture. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Now listen to this verse. Now all things are of God. When you're born again, now all things are of God. Amen. Can you see that? 
you begin to, you begin to see everything in light of God's word, not just in, in circumstances and situations. Respond to it with God's word. There's basically three stages of, of the Christian life. And this is in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. He, he writes to the little ch children, he says, and you worship because you know that your sins have been forgiven. The first revelation you get is my sins are forgiven, and you just love the Father for it. A baby Christian, you're just all excited that your sins are forgiven. I, I, I was glad. I was, a, I was a bad sinner, so when I figured out that God was going to wash away all my sins, I was a happy person. Amen? Anybody else had that revelation? That he washed away all my sins and therefore now was part of the kingdom of God. I was going to heaven because of the gift of his salvation. Wow. That's what little children, but you can't just live there. You want to stay happy because of that. But the next one are the young men. He says, you young men in the Lord, there would be young ladies too. You know what? You have overcome the enemy. You've learned how to deal with the devil and keep him out of your life. He says, so as a baby Christian, you can walk around, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. But then as you grow a little bit, you say, I'm forgiven. And Satan, get thee behind me. I'm going to overcome by the blood of the lamb. Amen. You have no authority in my life, and you start taking authority over the devil. Amen. But then you have the fathers in the Lord when you grow mature. And they just know everything's from God. Even when it looks like it's the devil, it's not the devil. It's God still allowing things to happen. And you see it all through the eyes that God has a greater plan. And you can trust God in the midst of the mess that you're in. Did that make sense? Now you can go read that and that's what it talks about. But we're going to go on to number six. Number six, my faith is growing stronger and it's, ca and it's causing me to become more faithful. We need to be growing. My faith is growing stronger through all these things that go on and it makes me more faithful. Now let's turn here. It's going to be in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Now guys, this kind of blows the whole worldly concept of how everybody's supposed to have the same. The Bible doesn't teach that. Listen to what Jesus writes right here. This is red letter. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each one according to his ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and he traded them and made another five talents. Likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came to settle accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents, and look, I've gained five more talents besides them. And the Lord said to him, what? Well done. Good and faithful servant. Who wants to hear that when you get to heaven? Amen. You better be doing something with what God has given you. Okay? For you are faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents, and look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. For you have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy, joy of the Lord. Then he who had received only one talent came and said, Lord. Now listen to what he's going to say to his Lord. Lord, I knew you were a hard man. Wow. Thank you for that. Reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you do not scatter. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy. Somebody, so y'all hear that? Lazy servant. If you're lazy, 
God's not going to give you anything to bring increase into your life. In fact, what you do have will take away. Amen. So there are people that are going to sow. They're going to bring increase. <coughs> they're going to work. And then they got lazy people that just expect to just get. Guess what he called them? Listen, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have it received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. As they say, this is God's word. Amen. If that bothers you, you deal, deal with God. I'm just a messenger. Amen. Amen. What's the story here? Don't be lazy. He put Adam and Eve in the earth. He put Adam in the garden to tend and take care of the earth. He said, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. I bless you. I bless the works of your hands. Therefore, go to work with your hands and bring increase. But if you're not going to believe me, if you're not going to trust me, you're going to be afraid, you will, you will lack. And guess what happened? The first brothers, one was envious over the other brother because God received his offering. Abel's offering was received and Cain's was not. Cain was overwhelmed with anger, bitterness, and he killed his brother. It said sin was at the door. And he says, if you do right, will you not, he'll go well with you. But he didn't. He went out into the field and he murdered his brother. Where there is envy and strife and division, you're just a babe. You, we, we begin to destroy ourselves. You're getting some out of this? I'm it's, we're kind of teaching this morning. So if you want increase, guess what you got to learn to do? Amen. Take what God has given you and to use it to build the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? To one who has, more will be given. Today's world has said, he who has, let's take from him and give it to the have-nots. It's the word of God. Number seven. As I grow, it says, I desire to express his love in all of, all of life's circumstances. I got to learn to love no matter what. I got to even learn to love my enemies. See, love will overcome everything. Amen. I won't spend a lot of time on that. We've been teaching a lot on love. But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says this. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Bearing with one another. That means putting up with everybody's junk. And forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint, listen, just a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of peace. If you got a complaint, don't go complain and gossip to everybody. Forgive. Isn't that what it just said? Even if you have a complaint against somebody, if you're growing as a mature Christian, you learn to bridle your tongue. Yeah. Don't complain about everything and everyone. Complain, complain, complain. You ever have any times your phone rings and you know it's a complaint or you don't want to answer it? Might be one of your relatives. On your friends or whatever. Here we go. What did he read? This, yeah, this Facebook thing, sometimes it, it kind of gets to me. Because <clears throat> people who are like always aggressively into their opinions and political stuff, and they, they send me all this stuff in my messenger thing. And it's like, I don't have time to read all of that. And do you really believe half of what you're reading? Come on. It's very easy to prophesy after it happens. Somebody's going to get that. Prophecy is supposed to be foretelling, not telling me what happened. Amen. <laughs> Pro 
Praise God. The next one, number eight. We're almost there. We only got 12 left. I view service and serving others as an honor and not a burden. Amen. Come on, church. We need to get this. When you have the opportunity to serve somebody else, to bless somebody else, it's going to make you full of joy and happy, and it's going to bless your life, and that's a mature Christian that's not always looking to be served, but is ready to serve. Amen. It's an honor to be able to serve you. And I tell you, there's sometimes, I mean, as a pastor and been doing this for 28 years now, been doing ministry over 30 years, I can get aggravated with some sheep. <laughs> sheep make messes. Do you realize that? But I'm supposed to be a shepherd of the sheep and feed the sheep and take care of the sheep, clean the sheep. You know, sheep, they leave all kind of stuff behind. And I have an appointment. Stacey and I will have an appointment to meet with somebody. And it, it, we're supposed to meet them at uh, 4.30. And we had stuff to do that day. So we're in Alexandria. We're trying to do some stuff, do some errands, whatever we're doing. And so we're rushing, getting all our stuff, packing it all up, and get back. And we don't even have time to put our cold stuff into the refrigerator. We're gonna, we get here before 4.30 so we can meet with that person. And we get here at 4.30 and nobody shows up. They don't even call. They don't even... Say, hey, we couldn't make it today. We just got to sit there and we wasted our whole day because that sheep decided that they weren't going to show up or forgot about us. So what do I have to do since I'm a mature Christian? I got to learn not to complain about it. Or, or was I just complaining? <laughs> I got to say, you know, that's what we do. We serve. And you know who's going to be the one that misses out? The one who didn't show up. And then it even gets more, you know, can I just talk a little bit like a pastor? And what I'm going to tell them in the counseling session is the same thing they would have heard if they would have come to church Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. Or somebody comes to have a wedding, and I'm not talking about you if you got married here. <laughs> Especially if they're not a member of the church, or they just, you know, say they're going to be members, but they get married and they go somewhere else after they get married. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and they leave the church a mess. And we got to clean it up so we can have church on Sunday morning. And so while we're picking up behind them, I'm thinking... This is what God called me to do, is to serve people. Amen. When we're going to pray for the sick, I pray for the anointing on my life, that whenever I go in to pray for them, that when I lay hands on them, God's going to move and do something. Am I looking to them to give me anything? No. This is our opportunity. It's an honor to be able to pray for you. When somebody calls and there's a loved one that passed away and said, can you do the, the funeral? It'll be an honor. It's such an honor that you ask me to do that. Because it's an opportunity to serve. Whenever somebody is in need and you cook something and you bring it to them, do it with joy because whenever you're helping them, it's an honor to be able to serve Jesus. Y'all got that one? It's not a burden. But the enemy would want us to think in our mind it's a burden. And in these times, guys, we got such social distancing that we stay so far away from each other, we're losing this, this ministry of love and serving. Number nine, I become more and more aware of the presence of God in my life. If you're going, if check that, are you aware everywhere you go, God's with you? Psalms 139, where can I go from your spirit? How can I hide from your presence? If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there you're with me and your right hand will hold me. He's with us everywhere we go. When you say, I'm going to check you out and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding and all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You got to know that he's with you everywhere you go. So when you go into that place, when you go over there with that person, he's with you. 
He sees everything. You can't hide anything from him. And he's there not to condemn you, but to convict you, to put his finger on the things in your life that he wants you to learn to repent of so that you can actually be free. I'm increasingly aware of his presence in my life. And therefore, when I need God, I don't have to go find God. God's already with me. Amen? Amen? You know, some people say, my prayers don't even reach the ceiling. They don't have to. God lives right in here. Amen. Be aware and be God inside minded. Number 10. I guard my Bible reading in prayer time. Now, Lord, help me with that one. Because I get distracted so easy. I, but I have to get away. I'm so, I, I'm, I'm, I go to my study. I get over there and I get away from everything. And I can go in there and I, I don't get bothered. I can pray. And so, but you've got to learn to guard that because the enemy, the world, Satan, will take away your Bible time and your prayer time. You've got to purposely guard it if you're going to grow. And if you are a mature Christian, you do guard that time. I know some great men of God and women of God that there are certain times you're just not going to be able to talk to them because they're talking to the Lord. You've got to turn that device off. Amen. And turn your ear towards God. How did we ever make it before cell phones? I don't know, huh? I used to have a phone without an answering machine. If they didn't get to you, they couldn't even leave a message. <laughs> Amen. And then I remember it came out that you can, when you got home, you can dial something, star something, and it would tell you who the last phone call was. Y'all remember that? That was my answering machine for a while. Guard your Bible time and prayer time. Number 11. Okay, I like a dozen, so we're going to probably stop at a dozen. Huh? See, now 12 don't seem so long. If I would have said 12 at the beginning, you're, oh. <laughs> I prefer to spend more time with the Lord than with anybody else. Amen. Amen. Now, how about that? You know, the Bible actually teaches us that. Do you rather have time with the Lord than spend it with anyone else? I love Stacy, but I love God more. Better. And same, vice versa. Listen to what it says. Put this up on there. Matthew chapter 10, verse 35. For I have, for, for I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemy enemies will be those in his own house he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me strong words strong words but it's the truth if you love any of these people more than God they're your idol Amen. you have idols in your life doesn't say you're not to love them, but how can you love them if you don't love God more? You got to love them with the love of God. Amen? Amen. Number 12. Hallelujah. We're coming to the last one. I have peace. I mean, I have the peace of God in me and a desire to give that peace to others. I'm supposed to be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Some Christians are troublemakers, gossipers. Again, going back to the first scripture, where there's envy and strife and division, or you're not carnal and behaving as just mere men. We're not just mere men and women. We are born again new creations in Christ. We are created and recreated in the likeness and image of Almighty God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be able to change your world. Whenever you go somewhere, give peace. I, lo I love peace. Now, peace doesn't mean the lack of conflict. Peace is because you have the Prince of Peace living in you. 
Y'all get that? Because I can go into a, a house where there, there's arguing or conflict, and when I go, I'm bringing peace with me because I'm a peacemaker. If I let my peace out, I'm able to minister in that house and bring peace. If my peace does not rest upon that house, if they reject the ministry of the Prince of Peace, the peace will come back to me, and I'm going to leave. I'm not going to shove it on them. I'm going to wipe the dust from my feet, and they're going to have to deal with it themselves. And when I do that, I'm not going to stay up all night worried about them because I gave that to God. Amen? What an amazing principle. Now, I've learned this. Peace, my peace when I minister like that, even as I minister now, I let my peace go out. And you know what it's doing? It's like a little radar. It's bouncing off of y'all, you know, and it's discerning what's going on, and it comes back to me. And the Holy Spirit sometimes will point out a family or a person or somebody, and the whole message will turn because now the peace of God's come back, and he says, that person needs peace. And I'll begin to change my ministry because my peace is resting. They came to receive peace. And how many people need peace today in our world? So when you walk into your friend's house, whenever you let your peace out, and you're going to know if you can minister to them and talk to them about the Lord because it's going, to, it's going to give you, it's like discernment. It's going to come back to you and either rest upon you and rest in the house or it's going to be rejected and then you're not going to be able to minister in that house because they're not operating in faith and they're not ready to receive. That doesn't mean you can't do it again. But it's pretty amazing. How God will use those kind of, I don't want to get into stories right now, but there's so many times I've been in houses that when the peace of God rested, no matter how much conflict, even though there was a man sitting there with a 38 loaded gun on his table wanting to kill himself and about to, when that peace rested on that house, the enemy had no more authority. And I was able to minister the grace of God. It's pretty amazing, the power of peace. Jesus stood up in that boat and he said, peace be still, and the storms became calm and the wind quit blowing. Peace in your life is so important. All the stress in our world, sometimes you just got to sit back and trust God and receive peace. Amen? Y'all received today? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. It was just a dozen, huh? Not too bad. And I made it in time. Glory to God.